there, thank you. I just want to take us back to the point where GLF began a transition from a conference to an innovation, to an innovation system that Fergus just nicely laid out or an innovation platform. I think it's a bit of both, but it began in 2013, our first conference. Um, when at that time, social, everyone was saying, oh, well, it's just broadcast. No one's paying attention. Can you make change with this? And if you look at that, this is something called a Gephi chart, which was designed by two scientists at University of Michigan. And we work with them to do this. And you're right, it's, there's no coherent or conterminous conversation going on there. But then you see Peru the next year, and we reached 1.9 million the first year, which was amazing at the time, but so what? Two seven, and then 214 in Peru, we get to 6.7 million, and you can see there's starting to be a shape to this. There's starting to be, looks like the beginning of a conversation. And then we go to the next slide where things changed. This is Paris, 3,000 people tweeting to each other, 5,000 tweets that reach 15 million. This was unheard of at that time. No big deal today. We do it every conference. But if you look at, and all those dots we pull out, but we can actually show the 3,000 people that were talking there. But look, they're talking to each other. And, and GLF's in the middle there. And then all of these people, we started, we noticed two things with this. One is every one of these things, every one of these people at that time, Governor Brown or the head of uh, the CEO of Kellogg, or these were all change agents. I know that's an old word, but I brought it back. But also they're influencers. And then not only that is this is guided by science and knowledge. This conversation was framed by a knowledge committee. And we started thinking, okay, what do you do with this? This was on our desk for two years. And I called, I made a phone call to the author of the community of practice theory, Etienne, uh, I pronounced it wrong, Etienne Wagner. And I asked him, okay, what if, you know, we've seen lots of communities practice of 14,000, but what about, if you, could you do it at, you know, a hundred million? Is there anything stopping you? And he said, well, first of all, multi-sector community practice is called a landscape of practice. And two, no, if you could keep it under a frame, if you could make the conversation simple enough that people could riff on it, that they could, it might work. It's never been done or anything like it. So this is where we started to think of GLF as an innovation. Now, if you can imagine this, now what's happened in the past two years, we were working on digital communication and digital for five years. So this is 215, and then the, the COVID happened. And then suddenly we've gone from reaching 70 million to 1.5 billion in two years. And the engagement rate, that means the people engaging on social, they, they participate as up to two or 300,000 in a conference sometimes. I mean, the numbers are incredible. So this is the innovation of GLF, but it's, and more recently we've taken another innovation, something called strategic niche management, which Cora is gonna talk about. It's a new approach. It suggests that sustainable innovation uh, journeys can be facilitated by creating technological niches. And if such the niches were constructed appropriately, they would act as building blocks for a broader societal change towards sustainable development. And so when you look at the other, uh, innovations, and I'm going to go to uh, the other innovations are learning. You have to have learning. If we're going to create a billion people working together, and now this is shifting to talking to action on the ground, but you need learning and you need investment. So that's our sustainable investment innovation. And you need youth because this is going to take 10 years. And you need uh, monitoring evaluation. You need these innovations that we're working on. Um, so I'm going to hand it over now to my good friend Cora to tell us more about it. But this is why GLF is the innovation and the niches underneath it are building blocks, each of those innovations. And stewardship economy may be the sixth. We talked about the other day. It's a question mark, but we're looking at it. All right, thank you very much, Fergus and John. This is really interesting stuff and I, I can easily build upon. Uh, I will talk a little bit more on this niche innovation, which you may know may, may also be new to you. Uh, the next slide, please. I build here upon uh, Fergus talking about innovation as a verb and as a noun, and I will actually do both. Innovations as a noun uh, are, are everywhere. 
Um, the majority of innovations, however, as you see in the graph, they emerge, then quickly grow, but then disappear before even reaching maturity. And only few innovations really remain and stay and reach the critical point of being adopted at scale. Next slide, please. The, the reason for this is actually that innovations are not just technical inventions, as Fergus also mentioned. Technical inventions only become innovations if they are adopted by people, by you, by me. And people only adopt inventions if they like them and if they respond to a real problem that they face. And, and they only adopt them massively if they are supported by institutional frameworks, that is by markets or by policies that facilitate their adoption. Now, if all these three factors of technology, adoption and institutional support, if these are aligned, then a window of opportunities is created for innovations to emerge, to scale and to remain. Next slide, please. Next slide looks, uh, shows you a, a quite a famous graph. It looks more complicated than it is really. Just look at the yellow part, the upper part. That represents a landscape, a landscape with all the problems and, and all the pressures that, that, that push for change. Now at the bottom, you see all these little niche uh, um, uh, uh, changes or, or niche in ideas, I would say. They are represented by the arrows. There are many. And they're great and they're led by people, yet the vast majority of these remain in the green area. They, they remain at their niche forever. But a few of them, though, they manage to break through. And if they break through, they move up to the red part, the middle part of the graph, and they enter the social technical regime, or simply said, they enter society with its, its, its culture, its 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 science, its technology, its policies, its markets, and there they may transform this regime for the better. The next slide, please. The next slide follows one of such potential innovations. Once they break out of their niche, they go up, they grow, there they will be able to make a change. Now, our question at GLF is, how can we cultivate such innovation? Is that possible? And we believe that it is. Uh, and, and, and that works uh, first by identifying them, by finding them locally on the ground, then protecting them for a while, nurturing them, cultivate them and make them grow into maturity. And once matured, they will scale themselves through the system and, and, and they will improve the system for the better. The next slide, please. Do we have examples of how innovation can be cultivated? Yes, we have. At C4ECRAF, we do have the Landscape Academy that is part of the Global Landscapes Forum. And here, landscape innovations are identified, they are cultivated, and they are scaled through capacity development and education. Now, it's my great pleasure to hand over to the coordinator, that is Kimberly Merton. So, Kim, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Cora. So bearing this innovation framing in mind, the, the Landscape Academy is investing its time in, let's say, three main areas amongst others. The first is expanding the Landscape Academy, what most of you all know, by doubling its alumni network from currently 20,000 to 40,000, but also taking advantage of the digital revolution and developing the first of its kind sort of digital campus. Secondly, developing not only, well, moving from providing to enabling through resources and building toolkits such as the Blended Learning Toolkit, which we just launched recently, global and regional blended learning trajectories or training programs for its GLFX and youth constituency, so the local actor program, you'll hear more of those later, so that is one way of cultivating those programs and the wider GLF community. Thirdly, its newest edition, Restoration Education, mobilizing continental networks of inter-institutional educational institutes and organizations to support their development of restoration curricula, and this closely under the auspice of the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. But we've invited a dear colleague here today from Malawi to share some insights. Steve is with us today, Steve Makungwe, Dr. Steve Makungwe, and he's the director of the Center for Applied Systems Analysis in Malawi and the chapter coordinator of GLF Lilonga, as well as being a senior lecturer at the Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. 
Steve, just a question to you. How has the Landscape Academy helped you find and cultivate learning innovations on the ground, and particularly restoration education, which you're very heavily involved in, as an opportunity to find and cultivate those local innovations? Steve, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kim, for uh, giving me the floor. Uh, indeed, yes, uh, we know that uh, landscape restoration or restoration is a, a new phenomenon. And the countries have committed themselves, including Malawi, to restore 4.5 million hectares by 2030. But this is not a, a mean achievement to get to that end. We still have challenges in terms of capacity. Um, our education systems, uh, as many of us are aware, is really discipline based. Many of the issues that we normally, um, the curriculum is really looking at particular disciplines like in forestry, natural resource management or whatever. As such, the, uh, the graduates who come out of those programs are not well fit to advance landscape installation because of its nature. It's really much sectoral. It does do its much discipline. All these things have to be put into, into context. So realizing this challenge, uh, we, as we have been ourselves engaging with the uh, knowledge uh, from the Landscape Academy, where are new tools that have helped us to you know, build our knowledge and also how we can manage issues at a landscape, uh, landscape scale. Uh, these tools, programs, and uh, courses that uh, uh, Landscape Academy is offering has really built us, has provided us with tools and skills that are helping us to cultivate and build upon them to respond to local uh, situations in terms of capacity building within, within our, our country, Malawi. Uh, an example is that uh, one of the areas that we are looking at, realizing that uh, 2030 is not far away, uh, as we may want to work within the curriculum of our universities, you know, these are rigid institutions, to bring them new innovations, it becomes a bit more, it takes a bit of time. Now, what we have done is we have looked at it as a first uh, um, approach is to work with the already existing uh, practitioners, personnel who are implementing forest landscape installation projects as of now and try to build their capacity. And within this, we noted that it's not just a normal traditional way of teaching. We need to be much more innovative in, in, in our approach. This is where we looked at uh, the entire space of workforce within the um, implementation for uh, distillation projects, where we see different you know, layers. We have the governance level. We have got the, uh, again, the facilitation level and the actual farmers on the ground who are doing all these aspects. And all these, they needed to have their own skills or they need to understand uh, theoretical knowledge, practical skills, and also the attitudes that can actually be able to play together to achieve the ultimate result that they are looking at. So within that context, this is where now we uh, bring forward our new innovation where we think our learning system, education system, it has to be competence-based learning system, which each of these work, uh, workforce, each of these positions needs to acquire that skills that they need for them to perform properly rather than having a generic type of uh, knowledge which might not be able to yield the results on the ground. So we are we are doing this, we are piloting, we are already on the ground where we are really looking at uh, what information, what knowledge do we need to give or maybe to train or maybe make it available for our decision makers, which is more of awareness type of knowledge. What are the best mix of policies because they are really more at the policy level. Then the second level, in terms of the approach of, in terms of capacity building, we are looking at those who do facilitation, where now they have to understand the, uh, both the technical and the social skills, how they can mobilize communities and resolve conflicts at a landscape scale. And all those things, they need to have those skills at that level. And finally, it's the actual rock actors on the ground. You know, these are the people that are transforming, that work with the soil, bring all these aspects together. So this is, we thought this is an innovative, one of an innovative way uh, under which we can actually enhance and accelerate landscape installation uh, on the ground. And the other, another aspect that we're looking at for the future, how do you build new generation that can you know, advance this innovative uh, landscape installation or installation approaches? This is where we're looking at the university level. We know many of our universities and colleges 
many of our curriculum are discipline based, which we think will not be well suited for you know uh, landscape restoration. Restoration, as we are all aware of at landscape level, it really is a multifaceted, as we have mentioned earlier, and all these have to be looked into context, into a package. So as such, we are trying to bring up through the um, Landscape Academy, we are trying to come up with new innovative ways how we can actually you know, build new generation of ex uh, professionals who can advance this uh, landscape installation. This is where we are looking at the transformative curriculum, which uh, our universities, our colleges must adapt if we are able to address and produce relevant personnel that can advance this landscape installation. Within this context, this is where now we are working uh, as, as, as a pilot within Africa through the facilitation of landscape, I mean, uh, landscape academy, trying to bring up the tools. We are several, about five or six universities and colleges within Africa, we are coming together to pilot this new innovation. How do we bring in transformation in our university and college, uh, I mean, uh, curriculum, which can bring out the issues which are relevant to our local context. So we'll be exploring these innovations and uh, you know, cultivate it and nature it. And then the lessons that you are going to get out of the local experiences, they are going to form back the basic principles of transformative uh, education in Africa that will be very responsive to the current challenges we are facing in terms of degradation of our landscapes within, a, you know, in my own country in Malawi and also within the entire, the entire Africa. So I would say, yes, we are also in the educational system. We are trying to be more innovative. The innovations that, are, that we have today, we need to bring them into, into, uh, into um, uh, aspects that will be, will be more practical. So we are removing more from the classwork. We are going to the ground to be uh, practice-based innovations where people should not only have the theoretical, they need also to have the feel and the practical experience on the ground. So these are the issues that we are trying to integrate to bring it together as a key aspect so that uh, our graduates, they are fully rounded and they are all made ready to manage and facilitate landscape expression on the ground. So that's what I want to say regarding the innovations and how we are using the knowledge and expertise that we are acquiring through the, um, uh, through the Landscape Academy and how we are trying to contextualize that information at the ground to ensure that uh, our education systems, both at the university colleges and also, you know, in terms of uh, this, uh, uh, the, the education that we offer to people who have already graduated from the universities or they are already practicing, how we can build on and improve their capacity or their skills to advance forest landscape installation and be able to achieve our goals. Thank you so much. That's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much, Steve, for that. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. I now have the pleasure of handing over to Lars for the next presentation. Lars, are you with us? And Thank you. I'm team... here, yes, waiting for Brilliant. my slides to come up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please uh, back to slide one. I will present the case of Patspo in Ethiopia as an example of innovative institutional capacity development. The presentation was made with Son Mostop and Ramni Jamnadas, but owes, of course, credit to the Patspo team in Ethiopia, Team Trees in Nairobi our colleagues at the University of Copenhagen, the donor, Norad Nikfi, as well as, of course, the government of Ethiopia and our local partners. Next slide. What is the innovation then? Combining exploration, conservation, breeding, and delivery of quality planting material in one process through institutional development with mobilization of knowledge know-how, partners, and tree species, and genetic diversity. But is that new? Not really. FAO 
has had a forest genetic resource development program since the late 1960s, with a peak of establishment of national tree seed centers in Latin America, Asia and Africa in the 1990s, uh, with support from, among others, the NIDA. Gene ecology in near to nature forest management has been around for a couple of hundred years. And one can also say that the idea certainly was in the head of Alexander von Humboldt a long time ago. Nevertheless, we find that application in practice and adoption of climate appropriate portfolios of diversity represents innovation at a crucial time for our planet. Next slide. Preparation for the project in Ethiopia began in 2014 with the ambition to do it for all of Africa. We began implementation in 2017 and the second phase has just started with a funding agreement signed this week between ECRAF and Norway. Characteristics of the project is that it applies diversity breeding at large scale with high impact and is feasible for replication. We are right now taking it to Rwanda, Uganda and Burkina Faso as part of new funding agreements, including an IKI project to start next year. We are planning to take it further, as uh, Romney spoke about when presenting the transformative partnership platform on transforming the quality of tree planting on Monday. The TPP is built into this upcoming IKI project. Next slide, please. What have we done in Ethiopia? We have worked on multiple species for multiple environments, for multiple uses in multiple systems. Diversity is key. And those of you who followed the session with Roland Kint yesterday on species selection tools will already know a lot of this. On this slide, we have just listed some of the tangible outputs in Ethiopia that have been crucial for the acknowledgement of the program's success locally and globally. Next slide. In terms of impact, results will only show as the trees grow in the restoration program of Ethiopia. We know, however, from realized gains elsewhere, what it will mean, and we have modeled that for Ethiopia. It's so significant in terms of economy, climate and environment that it would be a crime not to invest further. And here uh, we have not listed the positive effects on biodiversity. We are currently working on quantifying those. Next slide, please. With respect to the title of the session and this presentation, what have we learned on innovative institutional capacity development? Of course, this is not over and we are not home yet, but there are some clear criteria that have contributed to the success of the project so far and some that will be crucial ahead. The biology, the science and the logistics behind or underneath the idea are complex, but the idea itself is simple. And it's backed by the fact that it pays, uh, has contributed to facilitate collaborating with society. Private business has not yet played a major role in the project, but we expect that it will as we move ahead. Some of the outcomes, the seed orchards are very visible in the landscape and make a convincing argument for our case. At the higher level, we have seen the willingness of donors to invest, return, and a willingness to spend sufficient time, uh, the time that is actually needed to do that kind of work. With phase two, the program will have run for nine years with 15 million US dollars invested by the donor, uh, NICFI, and of course, a huge contribution from the government of Ethiopia. The focus of phase two is apart from more of the same to keep momentum, that the production machinery so to speak, will be handed fully over to our local partners. It is thus not a quick fix. And even after phase two, we expect that there will be elements and new areas to support in a possible phase three. 
Next slide. Thank you for listening. Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Lars. Um, we're now going to have a video um, by uh, the GLF GLF X coordinator and use coordinator Yemi and Anna. Unfortunately, uh, both of them can't join us live today, so we have a pre-recorded video. Um, Adinda. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Yemi, I'm the GLFX coordinator. Hi everyone, and this is Anna, I am the GLF Youth Coordinator. Today we would like to share with you two key programs led by the Global Landscapes Forum that have a strong focus on local action on the ground. And we would also like to highlight how research carried out at C4 ECROF has a direct impact on landscape restoration through those two programs. Uh, thanks, Anna, for introducing. So the first one is the GLFX program, specifically the community-led GLF chapters, you know, which are our local change agents that mobilize their communities to hold place-based dialogues and accelerate actions in their landscapes. Through the chapter program, what we envision is connecting these local change agents to scientifically tested restoration solutions. And in turn, we can receive feedback that are informed by place-based needs to uh, further refine what constitutes restoration solutions. In that sense, our cyclical relationship between all scientists in chapters is capable of yielding, among others, needed legitimacy for research activities. For example, the science that is coming from C4E craft. So in summary, the GLF chapter program can be seen as an accelerator program that can help fill an important gap in the intersection of knowledge and actions. Perfect, thanks, Yami. And the second one is the Restoration Steward Program, which we started in 2020, when we selected six young people who were restoring their landscape to receive funding, training, and mentorship for a whole year. The mentorship element of this program is one of the most important ones, and it is also the one that allows us to link scientific research to action on the ground. In fact, Chief Steward is assigned to a mentor who usually is a scientist in a research organization. And at the beginning of each year, our stewards set up their restoration objectives with their mentor, who will then follow them throughout the whole journey as restoration stewards, providing the technical expertise needed to take action on their landscape. Among our different partners leading action on the ground, we are really lucky to have with us today Camille Rivera. She's the 2021 Wetland Restoration Steward. And I would now like to leave the floor to her and Irini Sakellari, the GLF Youth Assistant Coordinator, to have a quick conversation on how to activate research on the ground. Over to you, Camille and Irini. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, even if you're not here. Hi, Camille. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, so, Camille, let's uh, let's make the best of our very, very short time together. Um, could you briefly share with us how the knowledge you gained through the partnership with your mentor last year, who, by the way, happens to be a C4 scientist, supported and influenced your work on the ground? Thank you, Irene, and yes, nice to be here. So last year, or during the Restoration Steward, so Dr. Rupesh was my mentor, and he helped me in refining my goals for my restoration work and made sure I have enough information to do scientific assessment and also adding community perception study at the start of the program. And we had few exchanges of ideas and meetings to understand the overall background and literature reviews, especially in how to conduct an assessment. And, and also how to best tackle the local issue. And basically overall, he guided the process and included my plans and the local context and really trusted my work, especially what I know on the ground. So there's that good partnership between, you know, a scientist and a restoration practitioner like me. Thank you so much, Camille. And how important is the word you mentioned, trust. Um, I really love that. 
So now I think that through the Restoration Stewards program, though, we also see the other way around in the sense of like you're not just getting supported from the scientist, but you are also um, serving as a bridge to, to, to showcase to the mentor you're connected with um, what knowledge is important, actually, and what knowledge is actually needed on the ground. So I was wondering if you can share briefly with us what should be done to ensure um, better communication and mutual support between scientists and, of course, the knowledge they produce and young restoration practitioners on the ground, just like yourself. Yeah, so it's it's been a, a challenge ever since, you know, the communication of science to the public and even to restoration practitioners like me. And I think the best way is the access to this knowledge, more layman terminology and simple and concise points to remember. Because I work as a community manager in the Philippines and it helps transfer that knowledge when you put yourself in the shoes with the same background as the beneficiaries. So you have to really put yourself into that position that, you know, they're a local fisherman. Do they understand this term? Do they understand this, this flow, right? And it would also help how scientists can also be on the ground to understand if the knowledge they indeed produce are beneficial to communities in the local context. Because again, there is no one size fits all. When we do restoration here in the Philippines, you know, it's a 7,000 islands and one island is totally different from the other island. So my one site, for example, is different from the other site. And that has to be the message we have to remember. We need to understand the local context and the local issues to better implement the technology, better to implement the knowledge that, you know, the scientists are producing. Brilliant, Camille. Thank you so much. And I have one last question for you. So what is one thing that you would advise other young scientists and restoration practitioners? So my advice is just very simple. So like if, you know, everyone, we're all on this together and to understand each other and, you know, properly scale up, like, for example, what I'm working on ecosystem restoration, what I see with the young scientists, they really need to experience a bit of social science or even during their university days, there must be an incorporation of a social context because again, conservation in the real world is, is very different. It's very intrinsically connected to human well-being. So it's not separate. And, and the restoration practitioners at the same time must also include science-based method to ensure that there's best practices of restoration because it's already being researched and to reap more ecosystem benefits for the local area and to the local communities. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Camille. Trust, diversity, and the human element to conservation. Thank you so much uh, for this quick chat. Back to you, Anya.